The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. We're going to begin uh, 2 Peter again in chapter 2, but I've been trying to get a dear pastor friend of mine to come and to preach here at Southside for some time, and by the Lord's providence, we finally got it opened up, and he is here with us this morning. His name is Pastor Mike DeVries. Mike's pastored Flatirons Baptist Church in Boulder from 1994 to 2006. And then he helped with a a church plant in Northern Ridge Baptist in Erie in 2006 until currently. Uh, That's where I went and preached back in January when I wasn't here. They were out in Israel. And so what a beautiful, a neat story is we have this wonderful gal now in our college and career group named Kara Stockton. And she met them in Israel, and you did a great job telling her to come to Southside. So we we love her, and she's been a blessing here. Well, so Mike and his wife, Noelle, are with us this morning. And then uh, his three children have come with them. So we got Danae and her husband, uh, Brett Hill, and they have two kids, uh, Ivy, named after her aunt, and Parker. So little Ivy and Parker, welcome to you guys. We're so glad you're here. Uh, if you make noise, don't sweat it. We're just glad they're worshiping uh, with us. And then uh, his other daughter, Jamie. And Jamie is one of the sweetest girls you'll ever meet. I want you to meet her afterwards. Come get to know her. And then his other daughter, Ivy. Ivy, if you could kind of wave to everybody. And then Ivy brought her friend growing up from high school. They did sports together. And so we have their whole family that has come uh, to be with us. So we, we welcome you. In the, in the name of Christ, to, to just we're family, and we're glad you're here uh, to worship with us. Well, Mike has become one of my best brothers in the Lord, and, and we have uh, grown in our love for one another for a long time now. We used to meet for lunch kind of regularly when we were younger, and now it just seems a little harder now that we're getting older. Uh, Mike's a grandfather uh, now. <laughs> so uh, we, we're like-minded so much on every issue when we used to meet just theologically and methodologically and just our hearts are just knit and Mike has a deep deep love for Jesus Christ and and I would call him Bibline the man just bleeds the word of God and I have so much confidence as he stands up here this morning he will open this word and you will be blessed in it and so may God uh, bless our dear brother as he comes and brings us the word this morning Tim, call to preach, brother. Come on now. Sorry to disappoint you. All right. Um, I can honestly say, uh, from my perspective this morning, it's an honor to be here, and that there are a few guys in the world that I like better than Ken Murphy. So it's an honor to be here in the church in which he is shepherding, along with another, another, other faithful, able men. And so. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here this morning. Um, to open the word with me, we look at James chapter 1. Thankful to you, the church, the elders here that he came and preached for our church family back in January. We were looking forward to seeing Kara this morning. I understand she's sick, so uh, miss seeing her. But um, I, I love to preach. Uh, this is the second time now that I've preached after Ken has introduced me. And I sit there listening to him thinking, man, I wish I knew that guy. He's really awesome. <laughs> Um, so when I say I'm sorry to disappoint you, it, it can only go up downhill from here. Um, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. The title of the message this morning is Be a Doer of the Word. Be a Doer of the Word. James chapter 1. My goal is to show you from this text that while works in and of themselves are an insufficient way of relating to the Lord Jesus Christ, they are also a necessary ingredient for a right relationship with Him. The uh, little phrase there in verse 22 is where I got the title, but be doers of the word, and that, uh, for those of you who care, is the Greek word poieo, and I just traced that word through the scriptures as it occurs with the word word. Doers of the word, or doing the word, or do the word. So that's the basis of our message this morning. James is a man of extremely strong and deep faith in the Lord Jesus. Notice how he begins verse 1 of this book. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, there was a point in time when James would have rather died than said that. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for him to say those things earlier in his life? He did not grow up as a huge fan of his oldest brother. And I'm sure that he struggled with jealousy, confusion, regret, resentment, all the things that are part of sibling rivalries because of the curse of sin, and yet not there on Jesus' part, exacerbating, exacerbated on his part. I mean, he goes to his mother, right? Mom, Jesus hit me. <laughs> no, he didn't, you liar. <laughs> Every time. Well, all that changed at some point after the resurrection. James came to a personal saving faith in his oldest brother. He believed that his oldest brother really was God in human flesh, and he died for him. And so now when he describes himself, he can't think of any greater attribute or relationship or term to describe his perspective of his oldest brother now than I'm a servant, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has put all of his eggs in that basket. He's intentionally indentured himself to his oldest brother, and now he's fleshing that faith out in the ministry, in pastoral ministry, and the rest of this book is showing people what it looks like to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, what it looks like to really put your faith in Christ. This is what it looks like. And he's saying that being a doer of the word is a necessary, even though it's an insufficient ingredient in and of itself for an ongoing relationship with Jesus and the assurance of salvation. So let me put it to you this way. This is something that I challenge myself with on a regular basis because I need it. What have you done differently? What have you done differently since... The last sermon, last Sunday school lesson, the last small group lesson that you've heard, what have you done differently? For many years, I was deceived into thinking that I was a good Christian because I heard the word all the time. All the time. Listened to preaching, studied preaching, preached, taught, listened some more, read read some more. But listen to what James says. If you would follow with me, please, as I read James chapter 1, verses 21 to 27. Therefore, and I'm reading from the ESV, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So we've obviously gathered here together to worship God this morning, right? We're here to worship. Worship in the scriptures is coming to God on his terms. It includes a lot of things, but at the least it includes this, this kind of a sentiment. Lord, whatever you show me today from your word, I'll do it. Whatever it is, I'll do it. That's worship as a living sacrifice. I will repent of what I fall short, where I fall short. I will look afresh to Christ for all that he is and for all that he promises me. And then I will obey you no matter what you want me to do. Just please give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that will understand. 
So let's pray briefly to that end as we look at the perfect law of liberty. Heavenly Father, please help us with eyes that can see your word and see into it and pass just words on a page to what it's teaching us, what it's telling us, what it's asking of us, with ears that would hear, would hear your voice in these words, and with a heart that would be open and ready and willing to do whatever you say. This is worship. And so we come with open hearts this morning, asking as we open your word that you would do for us what we could never do for ourselves. That your spirit once again would be pleased to use your word to make your people like your son, that we might be to the praise of your glory. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So being a doer of the word, three elements of life that this affects. It first, well, frankly, being a doer of the word shows that you properly, properly understand the word itself. You get it. We understand it. We, we understand that this is God talking to us. This is not a Western construct. It is not a social convenience. It is not man-made myth. It is not whatever academia tries to make it. It is God speaking to us. And doing it is part of what it means to show that we get it. Being a doer of the word. How does Jesus mediate his lordship over our lives? Well, in this time of physical separation from him, while he's with us in an indwelling spirit, he's with us because of his omnipresence, he's physically away from us. He's, he's wedded himself to, to human flesh. He is the God-man, and he's not here now. He's coming back, but in that respect, he's not here. So how does he mediate his lordship over us? And the key way which he does that is through his word. This is how he rules in his church. He does it through his word. And what does that look like for people who call Jesus Lord, according to James, his younger brother? What does it look like? Well, you receive it with meekness, okay? Let's look at verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Able to save your soul. And I can't think of anything more in my best interest than having my soul saved. It's important. When you think about the saving of the soul and standing before God one day, holy without blame before him in love. Very important verse that Paul uses that echoes the sentiments of James, James chapter 2 in particular. But listen to Romans chapter 2 and verse 13. I want to show you the importance that the scriptures make in the saving of the soul and how it links it with doing the word. Romans 2.13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. That's a challenging passage of scripture, especially for those of us who are committed to the biblical doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. My purpose in bringing it up is to show you the urgency that the scriptures place on being a doer of the word. And I can assure you, as much as I can assure myself, that when you stand before God, you want to stand justified. And this passage links being justified before God with those who do what's written. And I would suggest that that starts with receiving it with meekness. Meekness is well-directed strength. Again, worship is coming to God and saying this, Lord, whatever you tell me to do today, I will direct all my strength to that end. That's receiving it with meekness. That's placing yourself under God's word. Your posture is, Lord, whatever you tell me. You then avoid self-deception. Look in verse 22. It says, be, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Deceiving yourselves. To me, that's very scary. Now, Eskimos, some Eskimo clans up in Alaska that I've read about, have resorted at times to deception when trying to kill a predatory wolf. What they'll do is they'll take the blood of an animal, 
that the wolf is typically stalking, and they'll take a knife and freeze it in it upside down, and they'll take it and uh, freeze it in this animal blood, and they'll take it and put it out in the pasture, and the wolf will come and free, free meal, right? And he starts to lick this ice block, and licking the ice, it numbs his tongue. And finally, he licks through the ice to the sharp blade of the knife, and he begins to cut his tongue and therefore lick his own blood and eventually lick himself into a, a, a state where he's no longer useful and he can either die or be killed by the Eskimo himself. Now, how do you avoid living in this world that is so tricky? The wiles of the devil. He, we are not smarter than he is. How do you live in this world and make it as a believer? How do you avoid licking things that are going to kill you? How do you learn to see things for yourself, about yourself, about this world that you otherwise couldn't see and otherwise would be a danger and are a danger? Well, James says part of it is be a doer of the word. If you, you remember that passage in Hebrews chapter 5? Hebrews chapter 5, it says, uh, you ought to by this time be teachers. Hebrews 5, 12, 13, and 14. The author of Hebrews says, you guys should be teachers by now, but you still need someone to teach you the basic rudimentary principles of life. And you're in need of milk and not strong meat. And the difference is, those who have, are able to eat strong meat are those who, by constant use, have developed their senses to discern both good and evil. Those who by constant use, by constant doing, have developed their senses, their physical senses that God uses to help us discern spiritual evil. That's another way of saying, be a doer of the word. Don't be vulnerable. Don't be an infant out there in need of milk. Be able to take care of yourself. Eat some meat. And what James says here in James chapter 1 to those who are in the habit of hearing the word but not doing it, you end up deceived. You end up worse off having heard the word than if you hadn't even heard it. If you don't translate that into doing. This is such a challenge for me because I spend so much time in the word. I can tell you something that's scary to me anyways I was walking well I got old early and I started bird watching when I was in my 20s <laughs> and uh, so I've been I've been on every continent in the world except Antarctica to visit missionaries and one of the things I love to do is, is look at the different bird life in these places and I was down in Guyana uh, South America and uh, I was walking um, just out in the, basically in the jungle and through these rivers and uh, there weren't rivers but canals and ditches and stuff like that and uh, looking for birds. Saw some really cool ones and I know you're thrilled for me. But <laughs> later on during that mission trip I was uh, down in the capital city of Georgetown and there was this guy selling these huge snake skins, the anaconda skins. 20 feet long at least. I don't remember exactly. But um, I asked him, I said, where did you get these? He said, I killed them. I said, where? He said, oh, in the canals and ditches all around here. <laughs> and uh, I didn't do as much bird watching after that. I was totally, I had no idea, I was clueless. I was totally deceived to my own potential peril. Now, let me, let me tell you something that's even scarier. The scariest verse in the Bible to me is Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's our word, does. He does the will. He does it. So being a doer of the word, this is important. It shows you understand the word itself. We do it. I think understand, I think of understanding the word. You cannot understand the word until you stand under the word. 
So this is what deep faith to James looks like. You have a willing, eager, meek, and humble submission to the Word of God, and you, you, you always are looking for ways to do it. You want to do it. You're a servant. That's what servants do. You've put all your eggs in that basket. All my hope is here. All my effort is him. He has done everything for me. The least I can do now is continue to serve him with the grace that he continues to provide. I'll do this. I'll die for my older brother, James says. I'll be a servant to him. I'll do the work. Secondly, being a doer of the word also shows that you're properly related, not just to the word itself, but the point behind the point to, to God himself. It's God's word. So there's your relationship to the word, and it's God's word. So it kind of takes us to that natural second level. You get him. Look in verse, let me keep reading verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. All right, let's pretend you've got something all over your face and it is not attractive. That's not hard for me. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. And then you get up in people's faces and, you know, you got mashed potatoes just smeared all over your face and you're talking to people and they're kind of, you know, they're trying to make gestures, trying to be nice about it, but you for, totally forgot that you are hideous. All right? He looks at himself, goes his way, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, there's another way to say does it, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer, there's our word, a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. He'll be blessed. Now, who do you think James thinks is doing the blessing? Of course, it's God. This man will be blessed in his doing. You experience the blessings of God. And I think it's important to understand that he says you'll be blessed in your doing. Not because you do, but in your doing. God blesses because he's gracious, never because we earn it. He's just so kind to us. And faith links us to him. But there's an arena in which we experience God's blessing, and that's while we do it. While we do it. Not because our object of faith would never be in our doing. That would, be, that would be pure legalism. Trusting my efforts for my relationship. Absolutely not. But if my relationship with God does not produce efforts, then my relationship with God is greatly in question. We sang this morning about, well, the reference was to Colossians, about being translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the son of his love. Have you been translated? Have you, have you come to Christ? Have you been moved by God's amazing grace from darkness to light? From the power of Satan unto God? This is not the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. This is infinitely bigger than that. This is not your best life now. This is your best life forever. But... There are real blessings that God pours on people while they obey the word. This man will be blessed in his doing. There are elements of what God has for you, for me in this life, the sweetness of the Spirit's fruit that are available only to those whose faith works. To those who are doers of the word. Speaking of being properly related to God, this God's word, so we, we're, it shows we get the word, we get him, we get God. We understand this is God. I should do nothing but say, Lord, whatever you tell me, I'll do it. Jesus, God in human flesh, was one time speaking in the synagogue in Galilee. Most likely Capernaum, um, I've, I've stood inside that synagogue in the airspace there. Somebody came up to him while he was in the middle of a rather contentious discussion with the Pharisees. And they said to him, Hey, Jesus, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, they're all outside. They want to talk to you. And this is what Jesus replied to him. It's kind of harsh, unless you get the point. He says, 
Matthew 12, 48 to 50. He replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and sister and brother. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven. That's the one who's really related to me. That's my real family. There's a family resemblance there. It, it looks like Jesus. That's what Jesus looks like. He does the Father's will. I have come not to do my own, but your will, Father. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And the more that's us, the more we look like him, the more there's a family resemblance there, the more we show a proper relationship to him. Jesus used the example of a house falling down flat at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He preached this long sermon. And then he says, you know, this is important because there's this guy who might build a house on the sand and it falls flat when the rains come, but there's wise people who build their house on the rock and when the rains come, it stands firm. And the difference was, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, he's a wise person. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he's a foolish person. His house falls flat when the storms of life come. And the Apostle John what was there. He was there when Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, bowed his knees before his disciples, including the one who betrayed him, and took his hands with warm water and a soft towel and took his thumbs and moved it between the toes of his disciples and washed their feet. From all the dirt and the muck and the mire that they had collected that day on the dusty roads of Jerusalem. And then he looked at them, he said, you know these things? You'll be happy if you do them. That's what he said. You'll be happy if you do them. It had to have impacted John. John was there, I'm sure he remembered, for the rest of his life. Not only his own emotions as Jesus washed his feet. But the physical feeling, the soft towel, the warm water, all these things. And he became the apostle of, of love. It was, that was the whole context of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It began this, this lengthy discourse on, I'm going to give you a new commandment now. I'm leaving, but I want you to stay here and love each other just like I have loved you. This is how all people will know that you're my disciples. If you love each other. Now you know these things, you'll be happy if you do them. And John took that to heart, very seriously. So that in 1 John, that first epistle, when he wrote that book, there are so many times he emphasizes in there, we need to be doers of the word. Do it. The one who says he is in the light must walk in the light. The one who says he is with him must be like him. Don't be like this. Be like this. One of the most effective ways of teaching what is right is by contrasting it with what is wrong. And so in one context, in John, 1 John, he says, stop loving the world and the things in the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father isn't in you. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not from the Father, it's from the world. And the world is passing away and all of its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Again, he does it. That's the contrast. Let me string all these verses together to give you a sense of what they're getting at. Let me just read them, and I've kind of edited them to be one long passage. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. He will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. For the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever, forever because whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother.
being a doer of the word shows you understand this, you understand him better than you would otherwise. And then lastly, from James, being a, the doer, being a doer of the word is an indication that you really get the body. You get us. Look at, look, look, look at verse 26. If anyone, this is right after, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If, here's an example, if anyone thinks he is religious, now what is a religious person? A religious person, among other things, he hears the word a lot. He spends a lot of time hearing the word. That's what a religious person does. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. <coughs> have you ever been that way? God knows I have way too much. Knowing, learning, learning my early years in seminary, learning how to dot my I's and cross my T's and treating my wife like, a, like I was a jerk. I was a jerk. Filling my head with all this Bible knowledge, spewing horrible things out of my mouth towards other people, like a fool. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. The person who listens to God's word, who hears God's word, listens to preaching, reads God's word, studies God's word, but it doesn't translate into how he treats other believers in a loving way. He speaks poorly to them, speaks poorly about them. But it's so easy to fall here, isn't it? Right? In chapter 3 of James, James says, nobody controls their tongue. It is an un Ruly fire. It's like a forest fire that covered the whole earth, set on fire by hell itself. <laughs> this is James. Pretty stark. So we know what it is to fall in this way. And the challenge is you think you're religious, you think you're a professional listener, and you don't translate that into doing, well, your listening is not helping you at all. In fact, it's worthless. Those are the words he uses. It's very telling to me. Very challenging. And especially for someone like me who uses his words for his vocation. This is a very strong challenge. Or the challenge to, to be one way in the way I speak to people at church and then another way in the way I speak to my family at home. I saw a cartoon one time. I don't remember where it was. But it was a, 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 a lady talking to her husband and saying, okay, why don't you act, uh, put on the happy face at home today like you do when you go to church to a pastor? It's easy to fall here. My, my son, Michael, is not here this morning. He's the only member of our family that's not able to be here. He's graduating from the Air Force Academy here in a couple of weeks, and so he's off with his buddies. But years ago, um, someone in our church paid for me and my family to go to Hawaii to teach a biblical counseling conference to a couple of churches over there. And so while we were there, uh, we took advantage of the time and saw some of the sites, and we... We were on Maui, and we did that, the, the road to Hana. I don't know if you've ever been there or seen this and done this. And uh, there's this place called the Seven Sacred Pools in Maui. And Michael, at this time, I believe he was six years old. Um, and he was bigger for his age, um, almost like twice the size of a normal six-year-old. And he, he loved to jump and leap off of tall precipices into water as a six-year-old. And I thought, this is cool. He's my son. He's tough. I'd never do it so I can live myself vicariously through him. I'm more of a wimp. And uh, so he, he's jumping at 15, 20 feet, you know, ah, boosh, into these, in this big pool. And everybody else is doing it, all these other teenagers. And they're having fun watching him. Well, he does it. And he takes a running start. And the ledge where everybody was jumping from was wet. And so... 
this little six-year-old took a running start and not quite yet coordinated as much as he should be, that foot hit that wet rock and he slipped. And Noel and I, we were down in the pool way over here, and we saw this. I could still remember it happening in slow motion. My six-year-old son slip and then pawing at the air all the way down and knowing, talking to myself over and over, this is not good. This is not good. This is not going to be good. This is not going... Okay, so he hits that water, belly flop, goes under, comes up, screaming and crying, and... Um, if I know Jesus walked on water and Peter walked on water. My wife has walked on water. I watched her walk <laughs> on water right across the top of that, picked him up. And what is a dad supposed to do? Son, get right back up there and do that again. We got a kid. <laughs> So, oh yeah, get back up there and do this again. So he got up there and he did it again. And uh, to this day, he is, he's happy jumping off cliffs. And I, I take credit for that because I can't take credit for <laughs> much else in his life. But we know what it is to uh, be living life and going on as normal and hit that ledge. and and in the way we use our tongues, just, we can see ourselves doing it. We can, we, we can talk to ourselves and hear ourselves saying these things and know we shouldn't be saying these things as if it was slow motion and we still do it and back, we hit the water and cause all sorts of pain. We know what that's like. James chapter three, James chapter four, verse 11, you could flip over there and look at this verse. As hard as it is to control the tongue, evidently James expects believers to learn by the grace of God and the power of an indwelling spirit through a knowledge of the word of God out of service to Christ to control their tongues. James chapter 4 and verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. You, don't want, you want to be a doer, not a judge. That's only God's prerogative, and he does not take rivals. And when we use our tongues to hurt other people, we're assuming the place of God. This is not good. This is not good. You come to see yourself as someone who's above the law. You get to legislate the law. You get to apply the law. You get to do all these things, but you're not under the law. And I tell you, if there's anything I don't want to be guilty of, and the Lord knows I am too much, it's using the scriptures to pistol whip people. It doesn't stop there with how you talk about them. It, stop, it, it goes back in chapter 1 even to how you treat them. This is what pure religion is. This is what true religion is. This is what undefiled religion is. They do the word. They visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions. They keep themselves unspotted from the world. This is what it's like. A doer of the word, when confronted with a needy person, those two things come together and something happens. <laughs> I witnessed a couple swear before a judge in Adams County yesterday as they adopted a little boy who was born to a mom who was a drug addict. And they adopted him, and they had to swear to, to take care of him as if he were one of their own children. That's pure and undefiled religion. That's doing it. In Guyana, I mentioned being there. In Guyana, there's this phenomenon called black water. It's, it's, it's perfectly pure water, but it's black because there, there are roots down there, and when the hot sun take, takes a, a pool of water and bakes the, bakes the water in this pool, when it comes in contact with these roots, the water just turns black. I remember going down there and watching a bunch of young people swim in this black water, and I thought, first of all, you know, snakes, and then secondly, black water. This is not good, but they said it's perfectly fine. The water is perfectly fine. It's just the natural reaction of what takes place when 
the roots and the hot water from the sun come together. Again, the natural reaction that takes place when a doer of the word and a needy person come together, something happens. The doer of the word actually does something. James will go on in chapter 2 to say, he doesn't say, oh, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, brother. What good is that, he says. So here's, here's my encouragement to you. For those of us who consider ourselves servants of the Lord of glory who died for us like we sang this morning, there should, you should do something differently every time you hear the word preached. If I, I did a little math, and I used a calculator, so I know it's right. But a little over one hour of preaching a week equals about 55 hours of preaching a year. To two weeks in a year. Every three years, that means I spend one week listening to God's Word. Just one straight week listening to God's Word. Just listening. A week every three years of my time is just listening, hearing God's word preached. At the age of 54, I turned 54 this past week. That means I have spent 18 straight weeks, 24-7. 18 weeks of my life just listening to preaching. That's a lot of time. And I've listened to way more than one hour a week. That is a safe estimate for anybody who comes to a church like this where the word is really taught. That's a lot of opportunities to be a doer of the word or to be worse off. To be deceived. So this is basically what worship is. It's, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do it. It's a sense of desperation. I hope you have no shame in admitting to the Lord, I desperately need you. I will do whatever you tell me to do. There's no shame in being a humble servant of the Lord. That's what James is saying. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, be a doer of the word. Don't deceive yourself. Don't live a useless life. Don't have a worthless religion. Don't waste all the time you hear listening. Be a doer. For Jesus' sake, so much at stake. Thank God his grace is sufficient. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you and praise you because your word is really, really clear. And it doesn't, doesn't leave us guessing or wondering what you think. It just, just tell us. So I would pray, Lord, that you would work in my heart and in our heart this morning that we would be careful, studious, attentive, disciplined, intentional hearers, and as much as we are hearers, make us doers. Show us and work in us. Grace is sufficient that we would be doers of your word, doers of the God of the word, doers of the word in each other's lives. Lord, make Southside Bible Church a church full of people who truly worship in spirit and in truth. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.